Welcome back to a special edition of Inside City Hall. With historic levels of damage to communities across New York and city schools closed for an unprecedented five days, many are getting concerned about the mental toll that all of this disruption might be taking on New York's children and families. Here to talk about that and give us some tips is child and adolescent psychiatrist Dr. Stephen Dickstein of the Child Mind Institute. Dr. Dickstein, thank you for joining us. No, thanks for having me. And uh, I was I told you before we came on, I was going to talk to you like a parent. I got a seven-year-old who's been uh, kind of rattling around the house the last few days, and he's been having a lot of fun. But to the extent that um, parents are, I mean, thank God we had no damage in my area at all. Absolutely. But it, it, for people who, you know, you can't hide that trees have fallen down, neighbors are gone, you know, uh, the boardwalk is washed away, the world has been shattered, maybe you can't even go back to your home. Uh, what do you tell kids about that? I mean, I think the, the most important thing that kids want to know is, are they safe right now? And what are you going to do to keep them safe? And they're really going to take their cues from the adults around them. I mean, I think that if, uh, if parents stay calm, if they talk about, you know, what we're doing and what's going on in a reasonable way, um, they'll understand that and they'll go on. And I think as much as possible, you want to keep them informed but not scared. So developmentally, obviously, you're going to tell, you know, your seven-year-old, you're going to tell them some things that you might not tell a three-year-old. And certainly teenagers are going to have other questions. But I think, uh, you know, being honest, being realistic and mm -hmm. trying to figure out what you're going to do to keep everybody safe is the most important thing. What, what if the parents who are supposed to be, you know, the kids are going to take the cues from the parents, what if the, what if the parents, what if the adults are frustrated, left in the dark, deprived of essential information, sure. you know, and pretty much at wit's end? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we've got to acknowledge that the adults are going to be really stressed. We're all stressed here. I mean, just getting here tonight is not easy. And it's pretty stressful. It's pretty stressful. And um, I think, you know, adults got to model how to deal with anxiety and frustration and and all the things we want kids to model. So, I mean, what we're doing now is obviously we're trying to stay informed as adults. We're trying to plan. We're not trying to do one thing at a time and not, uh, not endlessly get sucked into all the things that can really scare us. Because certainly it's a, it's a big deal that's happened to the city. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have changed. But if we can sort of, you know, focus on one thing at a time, uh, talk about the things we're frustrated with and try to deal with them one at a time. And also the great thing is we're really seeing a lot of people pull together. It's a chance to really see, you know, what does government do? What do neighborhoods do? What do communities do? It's a way to show that we can really solve a lot of problems together without getting to totally overwhelmed. Yeah. But it's not easy. Well, you know, but, but before I have to go away for a few sure. days, as I've had to do for all of this stuff, I, you know, I kind of give, give them the, the little pep talk. You know, you're going to be the man of the house. You got to help out mom. You got to be my eyes and ears. You got to keep her safe and all this kind of stuff, Tr which is the talk I got a long time ago. Absolutely. To try and get, sort of make him part of the thing, that he's got to sort of suck it up a little bit, maybe not whine so much, maybe not uh, get too bent out of shape over and missing his favorite cartoon if the cable goes out or something like that, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I mean, again, the, the kind of talk we all got, um, the great thing about that talk where you tell him he's going to be the man of the house, he's got to do a couple things, is you really gave him something to do. Because I think the hardest part is just telling kids, oh, just stay out of the way, don't do anything, You're, you can't be here, and we've just got to do all these scary things. But if you give him, you know, these are tasks to do, this is a new adventure, mm -hmm. this is something we've got to do all together, it really does make kids feel, you know, more confident and better. And also, the other thing you're talking about is, you know, with your family, you're making sure they have a routine. So even though they're not going to school, you want to make sure there's still some structure in the home. They're not just, you know, running wild. You right. try to set some things up, have bedtimes, have dinner times, but also have other activities that you might not do otherwise. Mm -hmm. But really trying to plan it out so it's not just a free-for-all, because really kids, you know, really thrive on structure and uh, you want to keep the family running. And then, and so then, and then the hard case, the one I actually don't personally know very much about, which is, you know, it's Breezy Point, right? It's, it's Tottenville. It's a place like Breezy Point where over 100 homes are just gone, where it's not just your family and your home, but almost everybody you know, or a whole lot of people you know. And, it, and there's no disguising this, and there's yeah, sure. no coming back from this. Like, everybody's house is just gone. Uh, and it was unexpected, and it was undeserved, and there's no, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Right. How do you explain that to a child? Um, I mean, I think the adults have to figure out how they understand it themselves. I, mean, I think that we all know that bad things happen. You can't prevent every bad thing from happening. And you can't guarantee a child that, that nothing bad will ever happen. That's not a realistic way to raise a child. Mm -hmm. um, but trying to, you know, stay together, stay supportive. And the other thing is, you know, just like any other kind of major trauma, major disaster, for some people it's going to be overwhelming and they need to get professional help. They really need to seek, you know, a counselor, a therapist, a psychiatrist, or someone to really work through these things. Mm -hmm. But right now, obviously, they got to know that, you know, their life is different. And uh, but they also got to know that you're going to work together to make sure they they're safe. And, then, and there's a you know there's a sort of a, a duality here that I don't I don't want to suck you into some some ancient uh, debate or anything like that. But a lot of people's their first instinct would be to talk to a friend or talk to clergy. 
which is not quite the same as talking with uh, a, a trained uh, psychologist or psychiatrist, right? Yeah, no, I think, again, the normal human things to do is get support from someone you trust. And your anybody, bartender, for example. Your bartender, yeah. your, you know, your pastor, your rabbi, I mean, whoever it is in your life, or you know, even you know, grandma, or whoever is the person you go to to talk about things, a person who's calm, a person you trust, a person who can give perspective, absolutely, that's what human beings have been do doing for you know, thousands of years before mm -hmm. they ever had psychiatrists, psychologists. I think that you know, what we can be helpful for, especially you know, mental health professionals, is when it gets you know, beyond the normal level of anxiety, when, you know, when troubles go on for far too long, when people are really not able to function. Um, sometimes we can, you know, use different techniques to help people cope with it. And uh, really, the more you face your fear, the better it gets. But it does take some time, and it really is a process. Would you, would you anticipate that um, happening, say, to, to, to children, to young people? Yeah, I mean, we definitely know that children can be traumatized by natural disasters, by any disruption. So it sounds like, you know, certainly on the news we've heard about, you know, fires and, and catastrophes and, and unfortunately uh, loss of life. And so certainly people can be traumatized by that. Um, and, you know, they may need treatment for that mm -hmm. as we go along. Um, but again, the great thing about it is most people are resilient. Kids are built and human beings are res built to withstand anxiety-provoking things. And as long as we stick together and try to maintain some sense of calm, it's really uh, you know, a very healthy thing. I guess the other tricky part is, you know, obviously you want to let people know about all the different things that are going on in the world. But one of the difficult things for kids is that at some point they need to turn the news off. They don't need hey, to be bombarded. Hey. I, I don't mean to, you know, not, not your news. Not you guys, inside City Hall. Not inside City Hall, of course not. But again, just you know, making sure you do everything in moderation. You want to be informed, but also you don't want to be overwhelmed and constantly, you know, being overwhelmed by these things and because it may distract you from the day-to-day -day things you need to do. Well, you, you know, look, uh, <laughs> never this station in, in all seriousness, but sometimes driving in the car, right. I'll, I'll try and catch up on the news if I've been out of the loop for a minute. And sometimes what they put on as the news of the day seems to be just about every bad or evil act that right. they could round up in the yeah. last 60 minutes. Uh, somebody got shot over here, somebody got robbed over there. And I'm thinking to myself, it's like, wow. No wonder people say the news is, is just nothing but bad news. No, I think it can be very scary because, yeah. again, if you're bombarded by all those scary messages, you know, the natural thing is, okay, my God, that's going to happen to me right now, when the truth is you know, we've got lots of things we need to worry about, but uh, you know, most of those things don't happen all the time. That's why they're news. They're, they're important. Well, you know, I'll tell you, we heard earlier tonight from somebody who you know, had studied the, uh, the disaster of Katrina mm -hmm. and said that, look, for a city that had to move or tried to move uh, upwards of 350,000 people, and came up with fewer than, at this point, fewer than 50 fatalities that, look, just statistically and by comparison and given what a horrific event this was, we have a lot to be thankful for at a minimum. And so that's, you know, one way, I guess, of trying to sort of uh, keep things in balance. Thanks a whole lot for, for, uh, for coming by. And um, I hope that you won't be overwhelmed with uh, uh, people who have uh, uh, not been able to cope with all of this. Thank you for providing some guidelines for us. Absolutely. That concludes this special edition of Inside City Hall. If you would like to make a comment about anything you heard tonight, we'd love to hear from you. Leave your name and a message at 212-379-3440 or send us an email at InsideCityHall at NY1.com. Or you can reach us by Twitter. Follow us at Errol Lewis or at Inside City Hall. Be sure to tune in tomorrow night when we'll be joined by the president of the New York Roadrunners, Mary Wittenberg, who also runs the New York City Marathon, which is indeed scheduled for this weekend. We're also going to host a debate between Grace Meng and Dan Halloran, the two candidates for a new congressional district in Queens. From all of us at New York One, thanks for watching. Have a great evening. New York One News at 11 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Louis Dodley. And I'm Elizabeth Caledon, and welcome to our continued...